Well, hello there everybody, and welcome back to Project Espa. My name is Yiji, and in this series I walk you through my process of world building my world Espa, with today's focus being on the second planet orbiting my main star, Salkin. This is going to be a chemistry heavy episode, so try not to break bad, and let's dive in. So let's start with a little recap. Thus far we build a trinary system for my world to inhabit, with the central star being sun-like. We then made an orbital planning calculating distances and other important properties for 8 orbits that we are now going to fill planet by planet. Last episode we put a small lava planet in our first orbit, and today we'll be filling up our second orbit with yet another planet. The second planet of the Ojoran system is probably the one that has changed the most drastically across all my iterations. The original 2013 version was called Munta, and was a red, rocky planet with no atmosphere. For Munta I never really had a strong vision I wanted to pursue, so I ended up renaming it Carbonia in the 2014 version, and making it a carbon planet instead. Now carbon planets are cool, but I think I struggled to justify it in a system where Espa existed at the same time, so I never ended up developing it deeply. That was until in 2017 I got more familiar with alternative types of planets, specifically the idea of having a Venus inspired sulfur planet appealed to me, so I renamed it again to Venal and made it a sulfur planet much cooler than Venus but still quite hot. For this version though I'm going to rename it again because Venal well it's just too obviously based on the name Venus. I wasn't exactly having a creativity blast when I came up with that one I guess. So let's rename this one to Selkin for now but stick broadly to the idea of a warm sulfur planet. Okay a sulfur planet then, but what is that actually? Essentially it's a hot planet with a ton of sulfur, to such an extent that the water cycle gets completely replaced with sulfuric acid, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide are both gaseous at room temperature and pressure, but sulfuric acid is liquid at room temperature. Its boiling point is almost 300 degrees celsius, so the planet's temperature needs to be below but close to that. That's a lot better than what we were working with last time on Akundor, but will still require a strong greenhouse effect. Luckily this too will be easier to implement, because I want the planet larger and more massive with a dense atmosphere anyways. Not crazy dense, but at least significantly more so than on Earth. Not super restrictive goals, and they should be relatively easy to make. I hope. Unlike Akundor, we are now far enough out where tidal locking is no longer a concern. My planet's rotation can basically be anything we want. Let's say it's a slow one, maybe 52 hours. This will create big temperature differences between days and nights. Well I'm gonna stop short here of actually making climate models for this world. Suffice to say this makes weather systems on the planet more credible. Let's give the planet a mass of about 60% that of the earth, and a size of just under 11,000 kilometers in diameter, running the same formulas as I did last time gives us a density of 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter, which is quite normal for a terrestrial planet of this nature. We then also know its escape velocity at 8.24 meters per second squared, or 0.84 g's, which is again fairly normal. In its current orbit of about 0.6 astronomical units from the star, its year will last just short of 180 days. As I said before, its distance is far enough out so the tidal locking will no longer be a concern, even at this system's large age. But it's still close enough where there is quite a significant solar flux, which will help us raise the effective temperature, using the previously used formulas. While we don't know the planet's albedo yet precisely, we can make a good estimate from knowing there will be sulfuric acid clouds in the atmosphere. We can approximate the effective temperature of Selkin to be around the freezing point, meaning we are going to need a significant greenhouse effect. Let's see if we can make that happen. Surprisingly, the greenhouse effect on sulfur planets can be expected to be rather strong, but also self-inhibiting. 
The reason why is mostly the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, which creates sulfur aerosols and bright clouds, which significantly raise the planet's albedo, depowering the greenhouse effect. This could be countered by just making the base greenhouse effect stronger, but that will be intense since we already need about 300 degrees of it. Worse yet, sulfur dioxide has a tendency, even at low concentrations, to create haze layers. Like what we saw in my last video on extraterrestrial greenhouse effects, haze layers create an anti-greenhouse effect, blocking sunlight from reaching the surface and depowering the greenhouse effect. While on Titan and Pluto these effects are quite weak, on Salkin, with its dense atmosphere, it has the potential to be huge. If you haven't checked my video on extraterrestrial greenhouse effects, check out the info card on screen right now. I tend to do these relevant case studies before each ESPA video I do, so if you want to learn more about how this works in detail, go check it out. Okay, but back to Salkin, fortunately not all hope is lost for our warm sulfur planet. The first thing we can do is, well, just make sulfur dioxide less common in the atmosphere, making it instead dominated by carbon dioxide, a much more reliable greenhouse gas that would easily be more resilient in the atmosphere than sulfur dioxide anyways. To prevent the remaining sulfur dioxide from forming aerosol haze layers, increasing the atmospheric density will also actually help because it would destabilize the aerosols as well as confine them to lower altitudes. This will reduce the impact of the anti-greenhouse effect significantly, as well as create a hazy mist hanging across the surface. Okay, so remember when I gave the melting points for those sulfur compounds earlier, particularly sulfuric acid? Well, of course it's never quite that simple. Those values are for room pressures of around 1 bar. I need Salkin to have a dense atmosphere to create our greenhouse effect, but this will also affect our boiling points, so all these values here interplay. Let's start by calculating the boiling point of sulfuric acid at 22 bars, which is the original pressure this planet had when it was still venal. If the heat of vaporization and the vapor pressure of a liquid at a certain temperature are known, the boiling point can be calculated using the Clausius Clapeyrian equation. I actually ended up making a sheet to calculate several substances boiling points automatically at a given pressure. Special thanks to Yash on my discord for helping me out with this. Right now it only calculates boiling points, but I'll see if I can somehow get melting points in there too. As you can see, here are some of the boiling points for 22 bars on Selkin. With this we can find out that sulfuric acid at 22 bars has a boiling point of about 575 degrees celsius. Now that's hot. Very hot too hot. But fortunately, the surface temperature doesn't need to be anywhere near the boiling point for enough sulfuric acid to evaporate on its own into the atmosphere. On Earth, the oceans never even come close to the boiling point, yet enough water vaporizes into the atmosphere to sustain the water cycle. How? At any given temperature, molecules in the liquid phase have a range of kinetic energies. Some molecules near the surface manage to gain enough energy to overcome their hydrogen bonds and escape into the air as vapor. This process happens even when the bulk temperature of the water is far below the boiling point. This process is facilitated by solar heat, which increases the kinetic energy at the surface, air saturation, evaporation is more potent when the air isn't already saturated, air movement, which removes vapor near the surface, desaturating the air, and surface area, which helps increase the evaporation area. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of a liquid equals atmospheric pressure, causing rapid phase change throughout the liquid. In contrast, evaporation involves only surface molecules and can occur at any temperature below the boiling point, but having it close to the boiling point will help. So now knowing the boiling point of sulfuric acid at our given temperature and pressure, let's at least try to make this planet very hot. Okay, but our current temperature of 280 degrees is still far, far below the 575 to the point where even though evaporation would occur, it wouldn't be much at all. Hardly enough to sustain a weather system where it would rain sulfuric acid. Obviously, we can do two things here, either raise the temperature or decrease the pressure. And I think it will be best to do the latter, because I can't really turn up the temperature above 300 degrees, because sulfuric acid begins to decompose into sulfur trioxide and dehydrogen oxide above 300. But at 280 degrees, 
decomposition would still be minimal. This then means that evaporation due to decomposition would also be limited. So let's say we drop the pressure to about 8 bars instead of 22. This brings our boiling point down almost 100 degrees to 478 degrees Celsius. If we put the following gases into our atmosphere, most of the greenhouse effect will be carried by carbon dioxide, which heat trapping capacity scales logarithmically with pressure. At a partial pressure of 5 bars it would be very significant. Meanwhile, sulfur dioxide absorbs infrared at 7 to 8 micrometers and 19 micrometer wavelengths, comparing to carbon dioxide's 15 micrometer band, while hydrogen sulfide absorbs strongly at 3 to 4 micrometers. Together, these three gases cover a broad band of outgoing thermal radiation. While there is still a slight haze and surface fog, the anti-greenhouse effect on this world would not be overpowered. While exactly calculating the greenhouse effect warming in degrees remains tricky, we are now in an environment where something on the order of 300 degrees of greenhouse warming is not unrealistic. Evaporation of surface sulfuric acid, while far lower than that of water on Earth, would now happen in large enough proportions to form clouds and the weather system. Nothing quite like the Earth, which has on average two-thirds of cloud cover, maybe Sulkin has about a quarter to a third. Now those clouds will eventually come down again as rain, boiling sulfuric acid rain. When this precipitation hits the ground, it will create heavy ground erosion, meaning elevation differences across the planet will be small. While some hills will exist, mountain ranges would quickly erode away. The sulfuric acid would pour into lakes and rivers flowing back to the sea to complete a sulfuric acid cycle. These highly acidic rivers will end up carving deep canyons on their way to the sea, similar to how water carved out the Great Canyon here on Earth, but orders of magnitudes faster. The edges of these steep, irregular gorges cutting deep into the rock formations. Imagine Dalo and Bryce Canyon on Earth. Much of the surface on Salkin would resemble these two unique locations. Meanwhile, floodplains would quickly evolve into terrace-shaped cliffs. And additional to those, sinkholes and caves would also be very common as the acid sips into the ground, creating collapsed structures and subterranean voids. This would all result in a fascinating labyrinthine topography all across the planet. The highly acidic environment would also put mineral formation into hyperdrive, meaning sulfur-based minerals such as gypsum, anhydrite, jerosite and alunite will be common all around, while the soil itself would be coarse and sandy, with various sulfuric colors such as yellow, brown and orange, painting a truly toxic and alien world out here. The sulfuric acid seas themselves would not be 100% pure though. While on Earth, the oceans are about 96% pure water, when dealing with such a corrosive acid as sulfuric acid, a lot of things will end up being dissolved in these hyperacidic seas, not least of which is oleum, which will exist in equilibrium through dissolved sulfur trioxide. Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide will also end up being dissolved in the seas from the atmosphere. All of this will end up creating an acid that is at best 80% pure, with a density of about 1.7 kg per litre and due to sulfate polymerization, it would be a lot thicker and syrup-like. Having such a relatively low purity actually helps increase evaporation by decreasing the boiling point. Though it's hard to calculate by how much precisely, we could potentially be looking at a decrease of 50 up to 100 degrees. So let's say our new boiling point is somewhere around 370 degrees. This will increase evaporation massively and introduce more cloud cover and acid rain. Having all these chemicals dissolved in the acid actually makes it even more corrosive. Due to the dissolved metals working as catalysts for redox reactions, as well as forming secondary acids such as sulfurous acid and hydrochloric acid. Under these conditions, the sea would be corrosive enough to dissolve silicate bedrock in a matter of hours. Suffice to say, you wouldn't want to go take a swim here. Another surface feature might surprisingly be sulfur dunes, whipped up if there is enough wind. This would probably happen a lot in the polar regions, where downwelling air could create a polar vortex. 
On Earth, the polar vortex is a high altitude band of winds circling the pole up to 50 kilometers above the surface. On Salkin, the denser atmosphere will lower the vortex altitude so that the polar regions on Salkin might experience stronger winds and thus have denser cloud formation as a consequence. Driven by the polar vortex, these clouds might extend significantly higher into the atmosphere, meaning the haze effect here would be stronger, cooling the region to maybe around 250 degrees. That may not seem like a lot, it's still insufferably hot after all, but this would decrease the frequency of acid rain, creating a relatively low erosion environment of yellow and orange dunes of sulfur whipped up by the wind at the poles. All by all the terrain on this planet is going to be highly dynamic and geologically unstable. All of this not even mentioning the increased volcanic activity due to the weakened crust from both acid erosion and the heat. Volcanoes on this planet will erode quickly, producing flat domes with slow outflow, flowing into lava fields, similar to some of the flatter pancake domes and flower volcanoes we see on Venus. Due to the high pressure, most eruptions would be effusive rather than explosive, meaning the lava will flow rather than burst out of the volcano, forming flat volcano domes across the surface of the planet that produce slow outflows generally, but explosive eruptions can still happen from time to time. Salkin is the second planet orbiting Ojor. It's a terrestrial planet slightly smaller than the Earth, orbiting the star at 0.59 astronomical units approximately every 180 days, and rotating its axis every 52 hours. Salkin is a sulfur-rich planet with a strong greenhouse effect carried by carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, which together raise the surface temperature on average to 286 degrees, ranging from 295 degrees at the equator to 250 degrees at the poles. At these temperatures, sulfuric acid is liquid and Salkin has shallow seas of sulfuric acid which roughly cover a third of the planet's surface. These seas are about 80% pure acid, along with various dissolved metals and gases making them even more toxic and corrosive. Due to the hot temperatures, clouds of sulfuric acid form through evaporation, which creates sulfuric acid rains, causing heavy ground erosion. No mountain ranges exist, but from some hills, rivers of acid trail back to the seas, eroding out deep canyons, caves and terraces on their way. Across the surface there hangs a perpetual pale yellowish fog composed of sulfate aerosols, obscuring the vision. From ESPA, Salkin would be the third brightest body in the sky depending on its position in orbit. At its brightest, brighter than Mars, but still dimmer than Venus. Alright, so that makes for a lovely second planet to add to our system. But for now, let's answer some comments. And for this episode, that's gonna be by Neckel. It does feel like sometimes my days also last as long as a year too, lol. That's so cool you could see a Kundor from Espa during the day. Also, when you're world building each planet, at what point do you usually decide to stop scientific realism and leave it up to the imagination? I feel like total realism would make me go crazy trying to achieve certain results. Well, that really is a great question, because it touches on world building philosophy. And I'm sure anyone who considers starting a world building project can be a bit intimidated by total realism. Now for ESPA, if we go back to my rules and goals video, my goal is actually soft realism and not hard realism. And I'll elaborate a bit more on why I decided that. So the first reason is scope management. In the real world, anything affects everything. And that goes for world building too. It's quite easy to unintentionally create a butterfly effect in your world. The configuration of my planets will affect the local trout population on ESPA. So you have to be careful of scope creep. And the way I see it, scope creep scales with harder realism. The more details you put in here, the more you are forced to put in over there as well. This is why it's great to plan these things out. But there is a second reason as well I don't pursue hard realism. And that is science itself is incomplete, setting a hard limit on how realistic you can be. If you want a specific example, right now we are unsure if clouds could exist on a lava planet like a Kundor, so I left that aspect blank. Basically, know the limits of your own knowledge and you can avoid falling into these world building pits and keep your project going long term. So I hope that answers your question. 
Make sure you're subscribed if you want to see how this continues, and leave me a comment telling me what you think of Salkin, and if it's a good one, you might even make it into the next video. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one, where we're going to jump even deeper into this planetary system. Stay tuned. Thank you.